Hello, and thanks for joining us on your channel of choice, AIT. Welcome to People, Politics, and Power. Well, Nigeria continues its quest for a strong democracy built on a united VRI Federation as it looks to its youths for a bright future. The Wikipedia defines youth as the time of life when one is young, the time between childhood and adulthood. It is also defined as the appearance, freshness, vigor, and spirit characteristics of one who is young. It is generally assumed that it is when one is young and vigorous that he or she can put in the best into any endeavor. There is no debate in the fact that Nigeria has in history had a very full dose of young leaders predating the present dispensation. In post-independent Nigeria, uh, especially in this political landscape, uh, just smarting from a period of colonialism where youths who uh, imbibed the culture and discipline of leadership, people like Obafemi Awolowo, Namdi Azikwe, Sabubaka Tafua Balewa, who were in their 40s. Yakubu Gowan became head of state at the age of 32. Murtala Muhammad became head of state at the age of 38. Ibrahim Babangida in his early 40s, and Muhammadu Buhari just 38 when he first became head of state. Now in the present political dispensation, there has been a fair representation of youths in leadership positions, at least at the state level. It is left to individuals' imagination whether or not at that level these young leaders lived up to the general expectations. It is often said that the youths are the future of this country. That is a truism. It is only true of intellectual disciplines to assume the leadership role, of course, and there are millions of them. But we cannot say that of those of them who are at that age bracket, that they have set their minds on pecuniary gains because they belong to that impressionable age, the indulgent acts that are inimical to national cohesion. Notably though, there are youth vanguards who are becoming politically active and showing traits of leadership qualities. Now we can recall quickly the not too young to run group, which is making conscious efforts to develop a paradigm shift, at least on the political front. From the foregoing analysis, the mind is set on achieving what Macron uh, has done or uh, is doing by emerging president of France at the age of 39 in 2017. We need to examine the hurdles the youth will overcome to achieve that feat in Nigeria. On the political field, what are these hurdles? What should be done to dislodge them? Can any youth muster the political and financial wherewithal to overcome the influence of money bags and godfathers to attain those positions in governance and politics. Well, joining me to interrogate these issues are three very eminently qualified young Nigerians. Uh, and I'm joined by the national chairman of the Young Democratic Party, Georgina Dakpopo. Thank you so much for joining us, Thank Georgina. Thank you for having me. And of course, the national deputy president of the Nigeria Youth Council, or Ladimeji Ekemba. Thank you, Thank you so me, much sir. for Thank you for us. having me, sir. We also have a youth from the not too young to run group with us in the studio. He's in fact a member of the strategic team of the not too young to run. He's Dr. Lars Eze. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the program. Uh, 
we're going to be looking at what the youth can do as we move towards 2019 and in the discharge of what the young people feel Nigeria should look like. But um, before we go into our discussion, we would like to uh, take some sound bites from some Nigerian youths who are pushing very hard to create an opportunity for young Nigerians to run for elected political positions. Let's take a listen. As we speak, the electoral amendments are ongoing, the constitutional amendments are ongoing, and these amendments do have implications on the 2019 elections. And if we don't conclude this process in an expeditious manner, it will undermine the 2019 um, general elections. We are already in a state of national emergency um, with the delay in the passage of, this, of these laws. And so the president, the, the procedure, the constitutional prov provision is actually 30 days. If the president does not assent to a bill after 30 days, the National Assembly can actually veto um, the, the president. But we are putting this on record that considering the fact that we are in a national emergency, um, considering the fact that if the constitutional amendments and the electoral amendments are not concluded um, in the next couple of weeks, they could potentially, they could potentially undermine the integrity of the elections. Uh, thank you for, so much for staying with us. Now to our discussion, and of course, Georgina Dakpopo, Olajimeji Ekengba, and Lars Eze are very much in the studio. Let's begin by looking at what you would all consider to be the major hurdles for young people to get to public office. Well, uh, a major hurdle uh, is the constitutional provision that provides that you have to reach certain age to even aspire to be in a political office. And that's the hurdle that the Not Too Young to Run movement you know, seeks to remove so that our constitution will not in any way you know, use age as a criteria for people to lead. You believe that the age limit is too high a bar for the young people to, to scale? Yes, because uh, in our thinking, we feel that anybody who is old enough to vote should actually be old enough to be voted for. That's at the age of 18? Yes. Okay. So we now focus on the competence. Let the people choose. Let the people be the one to decide that this person is not competent enough or mature enough. You know, but of course, maturity is not directly proportional to age in most cases. After all, in Eastern, Eastern Africa, in places like Kenya and Uganda, we have seen students win elections to parliament. Absolutely. That people. Um, for me, personal, I think it's an issue of education. Education of the um, Nigerian populace. Uh, just politically, um, to become more politically aware. Because just like he uh, opined when he was speaking, he talked about um, let people make a choice based on competence. We know before now that um, what we have had before now is a monetized policy, where people go to the polls, especially in the rural areas and the low-income earners, and they're enticed, their voice are enticed by monetary um, um, considerations. considerations. If we have more politically aware people, more um, civic education, people realize that the power actually belongs in their hands, and it's not in the hands of these um, politicians in court who have spent years in the corridors of power and amassed so much wealth that they, they think they have the power to determine who should become um, the co come into elective offices, should come into governance. So I think the main challenge is education of the populace and drum populace. And of course, if that is settled, this issue of monetizing politics would considerably not have so much um, so much import, so much impact in the Nigerian. We will come to the issue democracy. of monetization, but if the age bar is so high even with competencies that are glaring, uh, is it possible that, I mean, it's almost impossible that political parties, which are the vehicles by which you must get to power anyway, yes. is, is it on, until, of course, uh, independent candidacy becomes a uh, constitutional uh, imperative? Yeah. I mean, 
uh, is it possible for you, in spite of all the competencies that young people will have, to, to aspire? That is, if, if your question is, if um, age has, of course it does. I agree with what he said. Mm -hmm. Age has a very, very vital role to play in that regard. Because before now, there was an age limit that um, did not favor the young people. And just like you said in your introduction, the young people are innovative. They are vibrant. That is when we can actually contribute our best towards the development of our country. We are asking our old people, we know, you are, we, know we, we love you, we appreciate you, we, we, we may not agree with what you have done to our country. But while you are still here, while you can still guide, let the younger ones come into office. Let them exercise their hands in governance. We should, let's, let's, let's channel that energy, that innovation towards something positive for our country. If this happens, even the old people will benefit from a better Nigeria. Salah well, aside from what the are along <laughs> this line? Well, aside from the point made by Mr. Lars Eze, as well as the Dakuku, my own view is the fact that we need to have self-esteem as Nigerian youth. We need to have self-belief. Now, it's a question of even if the age barrier is removed. Do they lack that at the moment? We do. I must confess here. You see, uh, positions like councillorship, chairmanship, are not the, the some of them do not have age stipulation, but you yet you see youth even with SSC, a, an old man of 80 is contesting for councillorship, and a youth of 25 30 is there watching, is even the one carrying bags for the man that wants to contest. That's lack of self belief. So, to me, my view is we should have the belief that we can do it. Well, let's start from there. So, but, but let's start from identifying what you think is responsible for the lack of self esteem. Yeah, yeah. It's the fact that there is this general practice and connotation that youth are future leaders. I, as a person, I believe we are today's leader. So the moment we have that belief in us, you cannot pass an exam if you don't have the belief that you are going to even you are even qualified to write the exam. Let's have the. Uh, like I want to appreciate what the not too younger uh, to run bill group are doing. But the fact is that let's start to so even complement what they are doing. Let's have that belief within ourselves that I can do it, you can do it as a youth. And uh, is, well, there are instances we've had uh, Speaker Dimeji Bankoli. Yes, I don't want to comment on whether he did well or not. Even the elderly, elderly ones to have uh, disappointed Nigerians. So it's not a question of it's only if the youth come. And there is a governor in a, a state in Nigeria, I don't want to be specific, and is a young man. So the question is if the governor did not have that belief that he could win the election, even if they ask him to come, he will say, no, 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 give it to a man of uh, 80, a man of 50, when I get to that age. Some youth have the belief that. If, even if you call them for leadership posts, they will say, no, wait, let me get to that level. I'm not yet at that level. So we should, uh, our self-belief, our self-esteem is part of the problem we have. Dr. Popo, what do you think is responsible for this uh, lack of self-esteem by this generation? Yes. Because like we said at the beginning, we have had young people drive the political process right from the uh, anti-colonial struggle. Yes. We have the likes of Chief of Bafemi Awolowo, a young man. Dr. Nadia Zikwe, a young man. Tony Enaho, a young man. I mean, you, we can keep counting. Mm. We have had the military leaders in this country who came to power at very young age. And the first group was by they, did it, they, they didn't disappoint yeah. and all of that. So yeah. what is responsible for this problem in this generation? OK, in one word, sit tight. The sit tight um, syndrome of those that um, come into power and acquired that taste for power. They didn't want to leave. Power is sweet. They didn't want to leave and they kind of found a way to um, bring the youth down, to make them feel, don't worry, to get to your turn. Just serve us first and then we'll reward you with peanuts. We'll reward you with an appointment here and there. And then we found the youth f um, being in servitude lack of a better word, being in servitude to these people in power, like you said, carrying their bags, being political thugs for them because you get peps from these people now and then. So it's, it still basically boils down to education. Because if you let this person know 
like a movement is prop um, propagating right now, and in my New Year message to YDP, that the highest office in the, in the land is the office of the citizen. It is not those in power. By the time people have civic education, which have been lacking in our um, school curriculum for a long time, what I, I exercise today as a national chairman is what I learned in social studies back in primary school. We, didn't, we, we, we stopped that for a long time in our curriculum. So people didn't even know what their duties were as citizens or what their duties were as followers or as leaders. So it still boils down to education. If you're able to educate these people properly, let the CSOs working together with the political parties go out there and educate Nigerians. Let them know that the power is in your hands, not in the hands of those people in political offices. Then we'll be able to um, minimize this, build the confidence of young people to come into power. What, what is in our educational system today, in our educational curriculum yes. today, uh, what's missing in it? that was there in the 30s and the 40s. I asked that question against the backdrop of the fact that the Awolowos, the Tony Enahoros, the Azikwes could as well have decided to benefit from the colonial system of that time. That's true. And enrich themselves, become what they want to become. It, it would have been much easier for them to do than to embark on the independence struggle which, which gave Nigeria political liberation, so to say, at that time. So what is missing? Um, what, what was there then that is <laughs> not here now? I wasn't in the 30s and the 40s, <laughs> first and foremost. <laughs> but I think um, that it's patriotism. Then we had selfless teachers, teachers that loved what they do. They loved the children they were imparting knowledge to. I wanted them to become better than what they were at that time. So it, it, it brought that human dignity in the minds of those that were being schooled then. These days we have teachers that lack of a better job to do. You go into teaching. Not because we want to impact that child for tomorrow, which is what teaching should be about, about which is what education should be about. It's not just about going to the board and A is for apple and B is for pole, um, ball. We should be able to weave into our education system a, a system that will, um, would dignify the human, human dignity, that will make you realize that you are the best that you can be if you strive for it. These days we have people that, we, in education system these days, people go to school and they, they can't even string a simple sentence in English because they probably paid their way through school. They bribed their teachers, they paid someone to sit for their exams, and they can't even string a sentence of English. So we need to sit up and really um, revamp the entire education um, system of the country because that is the bedrock of civilization. That is the bedrock of a developed country. That's mm. my take. So, so patriotism seems to be missing in the Nigeria of today, whether in the old or in the young, or even in the children who have been taught. I mean, that much Eugenia has, uh, has said. And then the educational system itself. So we are looking at the fundamentals. Before we mm. go into the sub, I mean, the superstructure of yes. the political system, let's look at the substructure. What are those building blocks? that we need to put in place, that are not there now, that will enhance young people's participation in politics. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think a lot of young people are very patriotic. And uh, you see that when uh, Nigeria gets to play football, you know, and also it comes, every Nigerian tends to be, show that patriotism. So I believe there is that innate patriotism in every Nigerian even those who choose to say they are not. But just see a foreigner that try to rubbish Nigeria. You see all of us come to say, even when we say it to ourselves, an average Nigerian will rise to say, no, we don't take this. So it shows that we still love our country. You know, for young people in particular, uh, I wouldn't want to agree that there is this low self-esteem. Of course, there are certain uh, persons that may have that, but uh, it's not a narrative of the majority. A lot of young Nigerians are very competent. A lot of young Nigerians are very innovative. A lot of young Nigerians are getting involved. But I, I think there is this calculated uh, attempt to kind of give a very negative narrative of the youth in this country. Uh, take, for instance, if people, a young person does something so fantastic and he makes headlines, most times you don't get the language youth being used. 
you know. But when it does something negative, the language youth, the word youth is made very prominent. So if majority of the Nigerian youth are bad, are incompetent as being portrayed, then the country would even be much worse than it is. So I believe the political system, even for those who are active in political parties, they are very young professionals, competent, experienced, who were student union leaders or youth council. These are structures that young people participate very actively and grow. They are in political parties, but when it's time to give opportunities to serve, the leadership with due respect to my father's generation and the older population, we want to get old someday. You know, it's our prayer that we get old. So we have huge respect for that generation. You know, but they prefer to get the worst among us, uh, you know, to empower. So you have those who can do it, but those that they get to, like right now, the states, uh, local government positions are almost like appointments you know, as chairman or councillors or whatever. So you only run when the powers that be have anointed you. So how many competent persons are there giving those opportunities, even those who are in the party? I agree that many more young persons need to get into the political system. But those that are there, when it's time to articulate papers, write manifesto, write beautiful things, they bring them. They write those campaign, they do uh, handle social media handles, uh, do uh, bring the intellectual things required to run the election. But when it's time to give appointments of you know, the various appointments they give, they look for the, those that were carrying ballot papers, those that will not ask them questions, those that are not very competent to give those positions to. It's not in 100% of cases, but in majority of cases. And that's the ones they used to weave this narrative that, oh, we gave opportunity to Mr. A, who is young, but he could not perform. But the former Senate president who happened to my, be my Senate, and Pius, became Senate president at 39. You know, and of course, youth, youth is up to the age of 35, but he became Senate president at 39 after two were removed. You know, he wasn't removed. He was able to navigate and completed his tenure. But, you know, Donald Duke, who many people used to give examples, you know, became governor at 37. And he left a legacy in Cross River State. But the narrative people would prefer to mention uh, a governor that is 40, became governor at 41 and is being seen as not doing well. But when they talk about the likes of those that did well and they were young, they will not say youth doing well. So that to me, I think we need to get the diagnosis right. Young people are driving the uh, entertainment sector. Young people are driving the ICT sector. And our economy, when it was rebased in 2014, was based on the contributions of all these sectors that are dominated by the youth. And if they can build businesses with minimal support from the scratch, and they are making this country proud in different levels, in sports, in ICT, in entertainment, in education, doing well both in country and out of the country, we cannot say that the youth are not ready. So we just need to create a system that will make the best among the youth to utilize their skills and lead our country mm -hmm. to where it should be. Yeah, Mr. Lajimeji, flowing from that, one of the negative narratives about young people yeah. in Nigeria is to say, oh, the young people are not ready for governance. And they, like you said, they cite examples of the uh, unreadiness of the, of the young people. Yeah. Uh, they are not very prominent in political parties. Uh, as of today, we have about 67 or 68 political parties. Uh, how many of the young people are there? How many young professionals uh, show interest at all in politics, not to talk of becoming members of political parties? Knowing fully where that by our constitution, as of today, the only way you can get to uh, public position is by election and you must stand on the platform of a political party to get there. Why is that narrative always there? We are not, I mean, the young people are not ready. They are not ready for this, they are not ready for that. But like you said, when it is something negative, uh, the, young, the youth is uh, almost all the time, yeah. the focus is mentioned. Mm -hmm. 
Well, my point is this, like uh, Mr. Dr. Alex said, Dr. Lax, yeah. The fact that I think it's a deliberate attempt by our elderly leaders to suppress the strength of the youth. Now, when I mean deliberate attempt is the fact that, like uh, Dakuku suggested that it's... Uh, Dakupo. 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 yeah. <laughs> suggested that it all emanated from our educational system. Now, you realize that most principals, vice chancellors, rector, their first point of action whenever they resume that their post is to find a way of clamping down student representative council, student union government. Mm. And whatever you don't practice, you don't inculcate in yourself. When I was in the secondary school, we started with student representative council, whereby you serve your colleague. By serving your colleagues, you have the, the patriotism is there. When I entered the university, I was the chief judge of my university. And you, you have that leadership quality in you, inculcating it, imbibing it. But these days, you realize that before you hear anything uh, SUG prescribed, even, I don't think there's even something called student representative council again in the secondary school. So when you don't practice this as a youth, even while a student, when you graduate, you just believe politics is meant for a social class of people. But when you've been, if you have started doing this, even from secondary school, then you will have the uh, intuition, you have the, the, the interest. The yearnings will be there. But if you do not do all this, when are you going to do it? Uh, to, to be honest, yes, some sir. of the uh, older generation that you see today, yes. they didn't have to have that experience in secondary school. I mean, secondary schools in those days, until you got into a tertiary institution, a university or a polytechnic, for instance, you never had experienced representative government, student unionism, and all of that. Yet, well, if I may cut in, sir, uh, about Macaulay, Awolowo was doing an extension program then, not within the four walls of the university, could gather people together, is made and agitate for our independence. So what we are saying is that we do not need to wait until you graduate, until you come to the society. Because by the time you come to the society... Precisely the point that I'm making, yes, sir. which is that you really do not need the, the school system to imbue in you the, the tendencies, uh, or the democratic tendencies that you speak about, yes, it may sharpen it. Yes, yes. But yes, yes, yes. it's not necessarily, we not necessarily build it in you. But, but it, it see, uh, like uh, in law, they say, uh, es abundante cotella. There is nothing to hair on the side of surplusage. It won't be wrong if we encourage that in our educational system to make sure that it's part of our education, that look, let this uh, youth. Let us realize and let us see the fact that, look, we are today's leader, not future leaders. The, see, the acronym, uh, future leaders of tomorrow, you will never be, you will wait until you are 70, until you are 80. And that's the point I think my colleagues are making, that mm. we should be active. We should, there should be this, uh, uh, this uh, interest towards driving the youth to be active in politics, even while in school. We don't, need, it, it's not necessarily to, you know, when you're talking about political office, we're not necessarily talking about political office created by the Constitution. There are, there are political office, for instance, student union government, it's also a political office, whether you like it or not. And you will see the likes of Dino Melai, started from the university. That's the example I'm trying to cite. Uh, people, let's, let's look at the whole st uh, political structure as it is today. Uh, political tutelage, the recruitment process probably is missing in the mix, in the political mix in Nigeria. So for instance, uh, in the US, you hardly will find any person who gets to, the, to Congress or to Senate without first start starting from a county to a state yeah. before thinking of the national level. But in our country, what you see most often is that somebody wakes up from one side of the bed and decides that he is running for president. 
He's not been a local government councillor. He's not been a local government chairman. He's not been a member of the state house of assembly. He's not gone to the national assembly before thinking of the highest office. And it, I mean, it trickles down that way. Somebody wakes up one day, he wants to be governor of a state. He does not have any political experience, any managerial experience, so to say. So where do we start from in, in uh, having to uh, build that tutelage, that political culture, that recruitment process? Are the political parties doing enough? I don't want to sound like a broken record, <laughs> but again, it's education. You know, like he was trying to portray, let it be a process from, from the schools, from thankfully my children's schools. Well, the school I went to, my secondary school, we didn't have representative councils. Yeah. But my children's, my children are in primary and secondary. From their primary school, they have representative councils already now. Mm. And it's helped to build So there is a conscious effort to do that uh, in, in most the, schools these, these days? These days, mm. yes encourage them to, to know, build up the, that leadership quality. Because it's not... Maybe you didn't have that uh, opportunity because at your time, we, Nigeria was under a military, military dispensation. Yes, it was. And it now we're in a democracy, and the schools are also beginning to democratize the, the processes in those schools. That's so. true. That's true. But for the political parties, um, before now, for that was one of the reasons why YDP was born. Because we realized that things went the way they were supposed to be in the parties that were present as at that time, especially in the big parties. So we felt there was a need for us to um, set up our own structure where we can, uh, uh, set up our own structure where we can um, help to um, do things the way they're supposed to be, to be done. That was one of the reasons why the people were born. For, um, and, then, and then recently, with the support of donor agencies and foreign governments, we've been having trainings, repeated trainings, because coincidentally, I'm also a member of the um, IPAC, executive member. So we're having trainings, discussions, talking to parties about internal democracy, talking to parties about building their parties as institutions, not just a channel of people to just walk in and out. So Nigeria is gradually um, towing the line of a modern democracy. It's going to be a cumbersome process because we've been used to one process for such a long time. But we are, we are going on that line. We are going towards that. And I think because of the Not Too Young to Wrong bill, it will also help to foster this tradition, this culture of starting from your local government, from your ward to local government. Because now we're having more young people interested in, poli in politics. So they'll notice start from the, little, uh, from the ward level first, and they'll grow through the ranks until we now have um, an experienced person as president. Mm. What we've had before, like you opined, was just people that wake up and say, I want to become president, without any prior, not even in the in private sector. They haven't excelled even in the private sector. But because they feel, I have the money, I have the connections, I know the right people, I can rule. And that will have been happening. For instance, in YDP, we are seriously considering not presenting a presidential aspirant. Even though we have people coming to us and they've spoken to us, it's not decided yet because we're still having meetings. We're having a next meeting soon to decide on that. But we've just felt let's just start from people the just basics. look for platforms. They, look they for want platforms. to buy platforms on which that they want is it. to run. So we feel let's just start from the basics. Let's 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 just start and just groom this thing, because we believe it's not just it's not just a political party. It's a movement. We want to make something different here. We had young people that came together because they weren't happy with the way things were. So let's try and change the narrative. Let's change things from the way they've always been done. So it's going to, it's not, change is not, it's never an easy thing. And it's never easily accepted, accepted. But it has, it has, it takes determination, focus, vision to accomplish what it is we want to do. And that is why I think parties, and we have a lot of young people in the system these days. Of the ones that just registered, 28 that were just registered, a lot of them are headed by young people. So we have more people that are becoming involved and are bringing their own set of systems that is influencing to a large extent the way political parties have taught before now. The unfortunate thing is that many young Nigerians, because of the economic morals we find ourselves, are beginning to vote with their feet. And that was why, uh, towards the end of 2017, the Nigerian government took a decision to uh, repatriate Nigerians who took uh, the decision to go to Libya and uh, or through Libya to uh, uh, Europe, uh, risking their lives 
going through very tortuous uh, journeys, uh, journeys that have taken the lives of many of uh, these Nigerians. And some of the returnees spoke to AIT in Benin City, the Edo State Capital, on their experiences and the reasons they embarked on the voyage to Europe through Libya. Let's take a listen. When I was selling uh, this uh, banana and uh, this orange, that's what I do every day, every day, and I don't have a place to stay. I squad with my mother and my kids. So I, I'm not okay. I'm not okay with my staying with her. I'm not getting what I want every time. So I feel I should just do, I should just go far from her, maybe a place where maybe she cannot be disturbing me and I, I, I'm not able to provide for her. Every time we quarry uh, a, a bad food or any other material things. So I feel I should just travel out of this country, maybe to just help me. That was how I tell one of my friends that I want to travel and she just say, okay, I should not worry. If she see any uh, connection, she'll just send me. So she connected me with her sister in Europe. So that was that I want to say we should come. But I lost her uh, in the desert. She died in the desert. What did she die? She died tasting of water. So I, I thank God that I'm alive. I'm th I thank God that I'm alive. I experienced people who, who, people who died there, how people die and how they are killing people over there. I do not get pity for Nigerians at all. I do not want to take I see Nigerians. They are dealing with them as if we are animals. You know, people are running out of the country because there is no job. There is nothing to do, especially graduates. If graduates are running out, what will you expect those who are not graduates to do? Somebody like me, I am not able to provide for my kids and my children, for myself. I'm not a graduate, but I also want to give my children a better life. I want to do something good, something I know I can do to take care of my children. I just want to do something. I just want to do something. I want to do something that will, that will give my children a better life, a better future. I don't want them to be like me. I think, I, I think they should do something. The, the, the government should do something for, for the youth in this country. Also, make, make things better for us. I cannot, I cannot be able to afford four cups of rice for my children. I cannot be able to buy food because of how things are cost. It's just that I'm, I'm, I'm just, it's like I'm lonely in the world. I just feel like going, even now that I'm here, I feel like going somewhere far away again because I'm not content with what I'm seeing now or what, uh, what is around me. I know the government is trying to, to fix people who, uh, that they have brought back, fix them in a, a, a place and also give them a training. But I need to work. I need to do something. I need to do any work, any work at all. I know I can work, I can know at the, at the, at the, at the, at the end of the month, I can be paid. So uh, assuming there is no the government to go there and bring them, many of them would have died there. So many people, they have forgotten, they, 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 they don't forget them for that side. Maybe, maybe some mothers, you know, say, they don't forget, say, yeah, my children, my picking, they exist. Maybe uh, one of the sudden, you just say, he come back. So it's something for you to see your child you have not seen for many years and you have not heard of him. It's something. We should appreciate what the government is doing. But I want to also beg him to do something for those people who are coming back so that they will not become vagabonds at the street. Because more than that, you see, there's nothing kidnappers, pocket picking, rapists, so many things will occur. Because as they are coming back, there is no job. It is also a problem for the government and for the society. Voices from the desert, you will say, because uh, that is a Libyan returnee, uh, one of the very many that uh, the Nigerian government has had to repatriate from Libya, unable to get uh, to Europe, and having uh, had to go through the ordeal of being enslaved by Libyans and uh, other Arab nationals. Uh, gentlemen and ladies, this is a sad story, but let's relate it to uh, the political recruitment process. Here we are, millions of young people who are unable to secure jobs, who, are, who do not have 
the privilege of getting a sound education. How do you intend, lads, to transmute such people into political actors? Uh, thank you very much. Um, listening to that uh, lady there, you know, there are some points I, I felt very much pained. You know, uh, it's just a reflection of what the young people are going through. To your question, how do we get them into the process? Um, a hungry person will not likely be very interested in politics. And if you have a hungry person in politics, um, will be much more interested food on the table. Not just hungry, but discontented. Discontented I mean, you person see a, as well. see a lot of discontent in that young lady. Very true. And these are potential tools that the bad politicians, you know, may unleash on the system and make the electoral process because a number of them will be very desperate to survive. You know, like she said, she, ha she wants a better life for her children. Good intention as it may be, but the step wasn't a good one. The same way some of them may want a better life, you know, and will now make themselves available to be used as political thugs, make themselves available to be used to be undermine the system, you know, because they are very cheap based on the low socioeconomic stage, you know, and everything that has to do with it. But it's also a challenge to the young people. Uh, We've gotten to a point that you don't just want to wait and be lamenting and complaining because the youth, our leaders of today, I agree with him, you know, not just tomorrow. We are leaders of today and the youth are over to thought of the population of Nigeria. Mm. You know, they are the ones that are more, li more likely to be alive in the next 30 years to either reap the benefits of what we are doing today or suffer the consequences of what we fail to do today or what we do wrong today. So I use this opportunity to, you know, like challenge every young person. No matter how discontented you may be, you know, we need to say, what can I do as an individual to make this country work and channel our energy in that regard? The Not Too Young to Run movement came from this fact that, oh, the constitution, yes, even someone might argue that, yes, the constitution said, uh, 40 and above could run for president, how many 40 year old are running? But it's not even for everyone to run. But it's just for you to not to be 35, and you'll be thinking that you're a kid. But when you know that a, a 30 year old could be president, for instance, in this country, and you're in business, you carry yourself as a potential president. You know, even though you don't have intention to run, but you say, oh, my mates are running for president. I should be more responsible. And not say, oh, life begins at 40. Mm. So, we need to take uh, the kind of energy we used on this campaign that made Taraba State that voted no in December, you know, and we inducted them into the Hall of Shame, <laughs> come back Monday this week to vote yes for the campaign, you know, and 31 uh, states all together have voted to say, okay, we are not getting what we want yet, but we've started a movement that got recognition of everybody in this country to say, oh, these young people are doing something. Let's also channel the movement to ready to run, which is another aspect where you know, young people need to get ready to run. And personally, I've joined the Alliance for New Nigeria, you know, that was registered last December. I was, was part of the movement from the beginning. Whether I'm running or not, I felt not just being part of the movement, we should be part of the process that brings credible people to run this country. And we are hoping strongly that the president uh, will is going to put ascent uh, from not too young to run. Young we, are, to run. we are progressing to ready to run. <laughs> ready to run. So we want young people. There are so many that are very ready to go. Mm. And many are already declaring in different political parties. Join any political party of your choice. You identify things that are not going right. Ask yourself what needs to go right. Inform yourself and take actions to fix it. We can be on social media and criticize till tomorrow. It's not going to change anything. So just see the step we've taken on the movement that has influenced the constitutional change. Not many persons gave us a chance, but it took a collection of Nigerians that were purposeful, we engaged, we're not just insulting our leaders and older ones. We engaged them at different levels. Mm. We met with them. We did our research, you know. So, and we proposed it, and everybody, but in the media, everybody, people on the streets, saw that it's a noble thing. We didn't get the results we wanted. The reduction of age 
that was be is being passed is not actually what we wanted, but it's progress. You know, right now, young people can now come, make yourself ready, get into the ring, you know, and even those who are not running, support credible ones that will run, make yourself available for various positions, come out on March 14, for instance, and march to ask the president, please, assent to this constitutional amendment that, that we've achieved. So with the spirit that we used all over the Ni uh, Nigeria, young people used to push this legislative change. Imagine that we also channel it to choose the right leadership for this country. Mm. We are the majority and we can make that happen. Okay, Dakopo, this channeling discontentment for positive political ends, as it were. That, that's what we, we are talking about here now. We are seeing a situation uh, unfold before our, before our very eyes. After the shootings in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. school last week, young people, students, are, are, are making waves in the U.S. today. They, they, they are demanding gun control, yeah. mm -hmm. something that the, the older people have resisted for so many years. And it's, it's very likely that changes are going to happen. How do we channel the discontentment of these young, these young people, like that lady now, to uh, more positive political ends? <sighs> okay, that's a big question. <laughs> Um, you know, when I watched that video, when I listened to the video, it's quite touching. But there's something that struck me. She's a mother of children, and she wants something better for her children, which also goes to um, women. We need to get our women out there. We, it's not, I came into politics because I was tired of the status quo, and I was concerned for my children's future. I couldn't just sit back and they only have one passport, just a green passport, so they don't have another country. So I couldn't just sit back and keep on criticizing and, oh, politics is not for everybody. Politics is dirty. They're always going to clean it up. As a mother, if your house is dirty, you get in there and you clean it up. So I'm going to talk to the women folk. Don't just sit back and say, oh, it's the men that have to handle this. It's for the men. It's for everybody. Whether you're a young person, whether you're, especially the mothers, because there's this popular saying, educate a woman and you educate a nation. Because she's going to take the education back to her home and educate her children. So we need to get the women folk engaged in this as well. Let them talk to their children. The children you know when your child is doing the wrong thing? Counsel that child. Let help that child to channel that energy positively towards a better Nigeria. Mm. In Nigeria okay. is better. As a mother, you will benefit. Your child will benefit. We will all benefit from it. I understand time is running out, so mm. I'm just going to try and wrap this up quickly. It's about getting the women empowered. Get out there. You don't have to be a politician. You don't have to be an activist. But in your home, ensure the right thing is done. Get your children's um, energy channeled in the right direction. Okay. Whether they're 2 years old, whether they're 10 years old, whether they're 30 years old, talk to them. Use okay. your influence as a mother. I'll add me. Very quickly. Well, my own uh, suggestion and conclusion is that we should all participate in politics. Whether we are hungry, whether we are well-fed, participate in politics. The lady that I was talking now, if she's standing aloof, I want job, I want job. But you don't vote for the right person. You would never get the job. And like Dr. Lars said, you could, <laughs> you could wait till eternity and nothing will come. But this 2019 is an opportunity for us as Nigerian youths to get our PVC, vote for the right person. And I want to commend the effort of Dapupu. She's a youth and she's a leader of a political party, as well as a Kenga Imo who is the leader of African People's Party, and so many of them. So I want to commend this young uh, Nigerian youths who have taken the bull by the horn. Okay. We, we as youth should also do the same. That is what I want to say. Thank you very much, gentlemen and lady, uh, for coming. Dr. Lars Eze is a, a member of the strategic team of the Not Too Young to Run. Now, he says the Not Too Young to Run group, of course, is moving towards not ready to run. Ready to run. <laughs> of course. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Yes, Eze, for sir. coming. And, of course, uh, Georgina Dakpopo. Georgina Dakpopo is the national chairman of the Young Democratic Party. First time I'm uh, 
meeting you and hearing of a woman leading a, a, a political party. In 2015, we had a female presidential uh, as a candidate. Yes, candidate. She was not just an aspirant, she was a candidate. And she did very well in most of the debates that we, we had uh, at that time. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank and you. of course, Oladi Meji Ekengba, who is uh, the deputy the national president of the Nigeria Youth Council. Thank you so much for Thank coming. You so much, sir. All right, that's our program for today. Please uh, uh, join us again when we bring you a fresh edition of People, Politics, and Power. And of course, you can engage with us on all our social media platforms, even after the program. My name is Imonia Marere. Do have yourself a wonderful time for the rest of today. Bye for now.